are able, I invite you to stand for the reading of our sermon text for this morning. As the people stood for the reading of the law, so we stand for the reading of God's Word. Our text today comes from Paul's first letter to the Corinthian Christians, 12th chapter, beginning in the 12th verse. If you'd like to follow along in a pew Bible, you'll find that beginning on page 174 in the Newer Testament. 1 Corinthians 12, 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I'm not the hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I'm not the eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as God chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with great respect. Whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body. But the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Do all work miracles? I beg your pardon. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do not do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you a more excellent way. This is the word of God. Let the church hear what the Spirit is saying. Let us pray. Gracious God, speak to us your word today. May we hear and see and live according to your word, according to your vision. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <laughs> in this past year, as we've been going through our series of seminars, scientists and congregations, believers exploring science and theology. One of the things that has impressed me repeatedly is the incredible diversity of life in our world, and for all we know in the universe. And we, we 
really don't know much about the, the universe out there. But we know what we see here, and it's incredible. And when you think that we share the vast majority of our DNA with all these living things in the world, and that all of the stuff that makes us individual, that, that distinguishes us from one another, <coughs> is a, a tiny fraction of a percent of the DNA in our bodies. And at that tiny percent, we get this amazing diversity of human life, of animal life, plant life. It's just it's incredible. We are all so different and all unique. And it's because of one tiny little bit of that stuff within us. And even within our own bodies, all of the, the cells of our bodies have the same DNA. But they're all different. Skin cells are not muscle cells. Muscle cells are not nerve cells. They're all different. And all of these billions and billions and billions of cells have to work properly for the body to be healthy. When they don't perform the functions for which they, they were designed, for which they, they, they grew and developed, then we get illnesses and sicknesses and diseases. All these different bits, and yet the same DNA. All of these different bits, and yet a single body. This is not a good example. But you know what I mean. And this, this image of the body, one of the most familiar of the Christian scriptures, probably, is at the heart of Paul's message to the Corinthian churches. Now remember, almost all of Paul's letters to the churches focus on problems. We have one letter, the letter to the Philippian Christians, that doesn't address issues that are tearing the body apart. Paul begins in a negative place. And even in this letter, remember where it begins. What's the first thing after, after his introduction of himself to the, to the Corinthian Christians? What does he start talking about? Divisions in the church. Some of you say, I am of Paul. That is to say, Paul was my teacher. Paul was the one from whom I learned how to be a follower of Christ. Others of you say, I am of Paulus. Others say, I am of Cephas. And others say, I am of Christ. And this leads Paul to ask a question. Is Christ divided? Now for Paul, the answer obviously is no. And all of these, these, these divisions in the Corinthian Christian churches are for naught. They, they simply detract from the power and the potential and the possibility of the ministry that they could have together. By dividing themselves, they are dividing the body. And dividing the body in general is just not a good idea. So Paul is beginning in a place of, of, of problem for the Corinthian churches. And then he moves through various issues. And when he comes to this piece in chapter 12, He's talking about spiritual gifts. Because not only have these Corinthian Christians divided themselves according to their teachers, not only have they begun to think of themselves as superior to others because of their teachers, but they are dividing themselves according to spiritual gifts. They're all trying to be the eyes. They're all trying to be the ears. They're all trying to be the feet. And it won't work. He says to them, you have all of these gifts, you have all of these abilities and these talents, you have brilliant minds, and yet, and yet you would destroy 
the unity, the health, the wholeness of the body because of these differences instead of using them to build up the body. They, 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 they're not under, if he says, if you think that way, then you just not understood what, we, what we're talking about. We have all of these different members of the body, and yet we all drink of the same spirit. We have all these different members of the body, and yet we were all baptized in the same name. All the members are necessary. All the members are important to the faithful, full functioning of the body. <clears throat> and every gift, every ability, every thought, every hope, every dream, everything you are, he tells these Christians in Corinth, you use to grow the body. You use in the service of Jesus Messiah. You use in the service of the gospel. Everything. And if you don't, it's just selfishness. If you don't, it's just detracting from what could be it's taking away from the fullness of the vision of God for the body. It takes away from what can happen. And then where does it go? Paul ends this, this passage by talking about a variety of gifts. And he, he sort of ranks them, which seems, at least, to contradict what he's been talking about before, doesn't it? <clears throat> he kind of ranks them. But notice how he ranks them. The gifts that he names first work most to the benefit of the body. The gifts that he names last work most, at least in his estimation, to the benefit of the individual. He doesn't say that those, those least gifts are bad, you see. But they don't do the most for the body. What does the most for the body? What builds up the body most? Apostles, prophets, teachers. The thing that all of these three first ones have in common is that they, they give knowledge, they give hope, they give inspiration, they spread the good news. The prophets, don't get messed up in that, it's not talking about predicting the future. Prophecy is interpreting the word of God. It's preaching. Apostles plant churches. Teachers build up individuals, build up the body with knowledge. Then needs of power, gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership. Notice how far down that is. Various kinds of tongues. And all of these gifts matter. Now we, we like to think but that's what we believe as well in our modern world. We like to think that every person matters. But our world doesn't believe that. The world tells us that CEOs of companies and corporations are hugely more important than the people who, who make the products that those companies sell. And we know that because these companies give CEOs six and seven and eight figure salaries and bonuses while paying the workers hourly wages that may or may not include benefits such as health care. That tells us who really matters.
We like to think that we, we, we believe Paul's message about the, the necessity and the unity and, and the, 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 the worth of every part of the body. But even in churches, very often, pastors or other leaders are considered to be more important than the people who do the work of the church. I, I, none of you feel that way. I hope I don't feel that way. Some days I know I do. But every member of the body is essential to the full working, the effective working of the ministry of that body. Paul's metaphor of the body precludes the possibility of any part thinking it is superior or inferior to any other part of the body. Everything that we do, everything you do, matters. And if you choose not to do something, we all pay a price. And I think this is really the heart of what Paul is saying. If we fail, if we fall short, we fail all together. If one heart suffers, we all suffer together with it. And if we succeed and thrive, we succeed and thrive together. But we really don't believe that, I'm afraid. Especially in the United States, <clears throat> we have this, this myth of the self-made person. The person who rises from rags to riches, the Horatio Alger characters of the 19th, or the 18th, 19th century, all of these people who start with nothing and build up to this great person of industry or, or science or, or politics or whatever. The world tells us we, we do it on our own. We succeed on our own. But friends, it is a pernicious lie. We do succeed. But none of us ever succeeds on his or her own. We build on the work of people who've come before us. We build our hopes on the possibility of what lies ahead of us. And we do it together. Or we do not do it at all. Now this, the, the thing is about this, this image, this organic image of the unity and necessity of every member of the body, is that no part of the body is expected to do anything it isn't capable of doing. We don't all have to be apostles. We don't all have to be prophets. We don't all have to be teachers. We don't all have to speak in tongues. We only have to do what we can do. But we have to do it for the body to be healthy and whole. We have to do it. We have to be who we are and use what we are. Here in the churches, we work hand in hand and side by side to do all that God calls us to do. To be all that God calls us to be. There is always hope. There is always direction. There is always potential. There is always life. Because we are all in it together. One body with many members. When I was in seminary, I read a book by a, a scholar named James B. Nelson. 
He used to teach in a seminary in, in the Twin Cities. I can't remember, remember which one it was. But his book was called Embodiment. And one of the things that has stuck with me, and even though it's 30 years ago, 30 years ago, one of the things that has stuck with me is he says in that book that our bodies are not something that we have. That's the way we typically think of it. That we are the owners of these bodies. My hands, my feet, my eyes, my head. We think of things as these, these pieces of us, these, these bodies, as what we have, what we own. But he says instead, what we have to understand is that our bodies are who we are. They are an integral part of our identity. We don't simply have bodies that we live in. We have bodies. We are bodies. We are spiritual. We are emotional. We are intellectual. But we are bodies. So are we all together. A body. One body with many members. And we are one among many members of an even larger body. And whether we're talking about individuals, or we're talking about individual congregations, or we're talking about the larger collection of congregations, we are all part of the body of Christ. And we do what we do to the glory of God in Jesus Messiah. We build up the body. And how do we do it? By following the more excellent way. We build up the body in love. We build up the body in love. We love each other. We love other bodies. We love people who are outside, and we bring them in. This is our mission. Surviving as an institution is not our mission. Making payroll twice a month is not our mission. Being the body of Christ, one body with many members, this is who we are. This is who God calls us to be and empowers us to be. I invite and encourage you to embrace this mode of being. Delight in one another. Build up one another in love. Embrace and welcome one another as God has embraced and welcomed you. Always remember that we are many members in one body, and God loves and welcomes and sustains us all in love. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you make us one body. We thank you that you empower us, that you enable us, that you guide us, that you challenge us, that you transform us by your grace, by your love. May we ever seek to be the body of Jesus Messiah in the world today. For we pray in his name. And for his glory.